in the world of tech policy, things, the wheels are coming off, guys. It's going really, really badly right now. Hey guys, welcome back to the Base Politics Podcast. I'm Hannah Cox here with Brad Palumbo. This week, Biden's bringing back one of Obama's worst policies. Trump admits the border wall isn't going to quite work out like he said it would. And no more unemployment for people who are still employed in California. Let's jump in. Brad, I don't know about you, but I'm having one of those weeks in politics where I hate everything. I can't stand the media news cycle right now because it's just so eaten up with basically Matt Gates versus Kevin McCarthy and this whole stupid government shutdown thing. And it's just, do you think we'll ever get back to actually talking about policy, really, at a national level? I don't know. I mean, the uh, the drama, I mean, the whole discourse over Jamal Bowman, who, this for folks that don't know, he's a New York Democratic congressman pulling a fire alarm and just then claiming he didn't know that when you pull a fire alarm, a fire alarm will go off. I mean, I I do get that this stuff is ultimately in the grand scheme of things, very inside baseball, very, uh, you know, D.C. Politico types and doesn't have much impact on everyday people's lives. But it just seems to suck the oxygen out of the room on the platforms, whether it's Twitter or cable news or whatever, where elites focus their time and energy. So it really does seem out of touch with everyday people. But it just is where we're at. And I don't know that it will change, to be honest. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, there actually is a lot going on beneath the surface that I wish we were paying more attention to. And we're going to try to keep you guys up to speed on this show. In the world of tech policy, things, the wheels are coming off, guys. It's going really, really badly right now. I do a lot around tech policy. In case you haven't been keeping up, the FTC just sued Amazon. They're trying to break them up for egregious crimes like giving you two-day shipping and giving you the option to buy now and making sure that their products are the cheapest deal you can find for those products on the internet. For those high crimes, they are being sued uh, by the government who wants to break them up or make them reform their business, aka make it way worse. You also, of course, have had the Google lawsuit going on at the same time. There's just so much bad circulating, and this is just on the court side, right? We've talked a lot about the bad bills going on legislatively that are also trying to come in and regulate tech. Two of those that I've covered extensively actually got picked up by the Supreme Court last week. So the cases out of Texas and Florida where Republicans passed bills essentially saying that they now had the power to tell social media companies how to moderate their content. Obviously unconstitutional, obviously horrible free speech violations, obviously would have really, really bad implications for the internet. Um, Those two laws have been sued over by NetChoice, who I'm a fellow for, and they've been taken up Supreme Court. So we'll be getting some interesting decisions on both of those in the near future. And now, on top of all of this, it seems that Biden decided it's a great time to bring back net neutrality. Brad, give us the lowdown. Yeah. So for folks that remember, net neutrality is the so-called name for an Obama-era policy regulating internet service providers, ISPs, So, for example, that would be AT&T, Comcast, Verizon, the people who sell you your modem and basically provide access to the Internet. And the Trump administration in 2017 repealed these rules. And then in 2018, that repeal went into effect. And it was one of the most hysterical moments in our politics that I can remember in terms of the alarmism and the panic. I mean, it was so severe. It was a full court press from the media. And I'm going to get into specific examples later, but it was so bad that FCC chair Ajit Pai, his family needed security. They were constantly being threatened. And a man was actually arrested, a California man, for threatening to kill his family over this obscure telecommunications policy. That's how heated it got. Do you remember that? How insane it got? Because I feel like that's been memory hold. I do because I know Ajit Pai. I actually was working with him on some separate issues during this time period when I was in Tennessee. He he cares a lot about occupational licensing reform. It's kind of like his pet policy project that he has on the side. So he was actually volunteering his time in Tennessee to help us with some of our efforts. And I talked to him in person about some of these actual death threats he and his family were experiencing. It was completely insane. The The temperature was through the roof. I 
I still will never quite understand how it built up because, again, like you said, oftentimes tech policy is pretty obscure. Even right now when I'm working on tech policy, I feel like in order to get people riled up about it, it's a lift, even when I think they really should care about it and, and be upset, like I do think with this Amazon case, for example, it's still pretty wonky, pretty in the weeds. So to get people riled up, you have to understand that it took a, a convergence of Obama and the media kind of working on behalf of Democrats, pushing this narrative that the sky was going to fall, that neutrality was going to ruin the Internet as we know it. And so I remember it being this sort of discourse where people on the left were just rabid about this. They were so mad about net neutrality. They were convinced that it was such a big, bad thing. And then you would ask them to explain the basic tenets of this policy, because again, it's quite wonky. And they wouldn't have the faintest idea of what it actually entailed. There was all kinds of propaganda out there. So it was interesting to see how badly Obama and his camp wanted to maintain this policy and how much they went into overdrive to get the media to work with them to rile people up. And it really was uh, a lot to do about nothing, right? This was always just a very common sense, basic free market capitalism reform, ensuring that there is competition, allowing for more innovation in this sector, and basically allowing these companies to make decisions that make the most sense for their consumers and for their bottom line. And for whatever reason, the left has been convinced that those are awful things to pursue. And that that seems to be the same mentality we see continuing right now with the FTC and Lena Khan and people so, of that ideology. Yeah. So the actual specific policy that they're looking to implement again is this net neutrality regulation, which subjects internet service providers to regulation and classification under old laws uh, that apply to like telephone services. And one, a couple things they do that were made a lot of these regulations, although they are, are, are sweeping is ban internet service providers from blocking or slowing down access to websites or online content, uh, and then also prohibit them from selectively speeding up service to favored websites or those that agree to pay extra fees. So those are the things we heard all about that what would happen if net neutrality was gone. Uh, in 2017, when they repealed it, we heard all these warnings about how you would have to start paying for a Google subscription, uh, or you would see your traffic throttled unless you paid $5.99 a month, or we would see uh, them blocking certain websites and favoring their own websites, all this stuff. And then basically nothing happened. But let's go through some of these predictions, Hannah. I pulled, can you just read these headlines I have down here? Oh, trip so down memory lane. All right, let's see. Uh, this is from GQ. They had a headline that said, how the FCC's killing of net neutrality will ruin the internet forever. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have The Nation that had a headline that read, if Trump's FCC repeals net neutrality, elites will rule the internet and the future. And then lastly, NBC News with, ending net neutrality will destroy everything that makes the internet great. <laughs> so, uh, Tad hyperbolic, one might say. Yeah. <laughs> then you had folks like uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, who repeatedly stated that it would be the end of the internet as we know it if this it rule was taken off the books. Here's a clip of him. A disastrous decision. It will impact every American. It will give huge advantages to big corporations, over small businesses, to big media companies, over smaller media outlets. Uh, we've got to do everything we can to defeat this thing in the courts and defeat it legislatively. And my personal favorite, Hannah, is this tweet from the Senate Democrats official account that's still up. And the tweet says, if we don't, and each word is spaced out by multiple lines, if we don't save net neutrality, you'll get the internet one word at a time. Hashtag save the internet. Hashtag net neutrality. All this, all this dire, dire um, alarmism. We repealed it in 2018. Nothing has happened. None of this materialized. They often say that politics is show business for ugly people. That the people who wanted to make it in show business and couldn't because they weren't pretty That's enough a good one. in the politics. Have you heard that? No, uh, I've never heard that. Often, That's a good one. Yeah, well, it's quite true. And I mean, the dramatics over here, you can tell that we've got some Hollywood rejects. Good grief. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> but I remember this. It really was. That was the the temperature it was at. It was at a fever pitch. And for whatever reason, people were so convinced that this was just going to mean the sky would fall on their heads. That it was going to just wreck innovation. And it really was an upside down narrative because the opposite was true all along. And you had a lot of people convinced that net neutrality, and this is, again, just a sleight of hand that they do a lot when it comes to tech policy. A lot of people were convinced that net neutrality was protecting capitalism, that it was something that you needed to protect capitalism, which is always just such a misnomer because, again, guys, the only real threat to capitalism is the government. So anytime the government's telling you this coming in to protect capitalism, it is probably not. It is probably a Trojan horse. And that is what net neutrality was, whereas getting rid of it actually was a good thing that Trump and his administration did that did move the Internet towards actual true market um, capitalism. So I, I always thought it was just such a to me it was an interesting policy, but actually it's such a great case study and manipulation and how the media and even online networks can be used to rile people up and convince them of, you know, the sky is green when the sky is blue. And it, I think it's because it is a little bit wonkier of a policy. I remember when this was at, at the fever pitch that was at having to sit down and learn it. And I was like, oh, this makes my brain hurt because I don't particularly love this you know, side of policy. It's not my area of expertise. And it does take a little bit of effort to dig into and understand. And the bottom line is most people won't take the time to do that. So they're very easy to mislead on dense policies like this. They won't. Uh, and and they're, so they're looking to re-implement this, even though they never really had much justification for it. But they said, well, if you take this away, all these bad things will happen. And then none of them happened. Uh, they are looking to re-implement re it uh, immediately in short order. So here is Biden's FCC chair, Jessica Rosenworcel, uh, her comments announcing this move. Because in 2017, the last administration took it up again and did something different. It announced that it would break with over a decade of consistent FCC policy and repeal the FCC's open internet rules, the ones that were held up by the court. Now, the public backlash was overwhelming. Maybe you remember it. People lit up our phone lines, clogged our email inboxes, and jammed our online comment system to express their disapproval. And despite this overwhelming opposition from the public, the FCC repealed net neutrality. In fact, the FCC's actions were so extreme, the United States Senate voted to restore the agency's open internet protections. Now, I believe this repeal of net neutrality put the FCC on the wrong side of history, the wrong side of the law, and the wrong side of the American public. It was not good then, and it makes even less sense now. It determined that this infrastructure, which the pandemic proved is so essential for modern life, needs no oversight, and I think that's just wrong. So today, we begin a process to make it right. This afternoon, I'm sharing with my colleagues a rulemaking that proposes to reinstate net neutrality. So one really interesting piece of follow-up reporting here, Hannah, from the Washington Examiner is that uh, Rosenworcel was only able to note one instance of an internet service provider throttling customers since the rules reversal in 2017, in which Verizon cut off data access to a California fire department mid-wildfire fighting. However, <laughs> the example would not have been considered illegal under the Obama era rules because it resulted from established data restrictions on the fire department's data package. So look, th that's hilarious to me because they can only find one example of any of this. Even the FCC chair and her army of research assistants and staffers who are re-implementing this rule can only find one incident that, viol that validates their narrative of the reasons this is necessary to put be put back in place. And that one doesn't even actually apply. The rules wouldn't have prevented it. That, I mean, how can anybody take this seriously? And so for folks that don't know, they're like, well, what's the harm? This is an incredibly complex regulatory scheme that costs huge amounts of money for these companies to comply with. Uh, complexity is a form of uh, a subsidy that actually helps the big tech companies. So that's actually why some of them support this. Uh, but really, it adds cost to the process. And that's why uh, during the Obama years when this was in place, we saw decreases in investment in broadband expansion. However, after net neutrality was repealed, internet speeds went up and investment in broadband expansion 
has gone up as well. So here's a, a, a little bit from an, a National Review article called The Death of the Internet Five Years Later. The evidence is indisputable today that in the five years since the FCC's decision to repeal net neutrality regulations went into effect, American consumers are benefiting from broadband networks that are stronger and more extensive than ever. According to independent measurement service Ookla, average fixed broadband speeds in the U.S. are 287% faster today than they were in June of 2018. Average mobile broadband speeds have increased even more at 570%. Millions more Americans have access to the internet today compared with 2018, thanks in large part to private investment in digital infrastructure. So look, none of the predictions about how this would be bad come true. So since this was scrapped in 2017 and expired in 2018, we were warned that the speeds would be throttled and certain websites would be blocked. It literally has not happened. They can't point to a single incident where that's really happened. And in fact, internet speeds are up uh, by several factors, by huge amounts. And we've seen expanded internet access and expanded broadband access. So at this point, it's like, how could they possibly justify this? And now we're seeing them stretch for new justifications like, oh, it's a national security thing or we need to regulate it so we can have authority in these other areas or whatever. To me, it's just a classic government power grab. They can't stand the idea that there's this sector they don't have a lot of control over, and they want to put it back into this um, archaic regulatory framework that, again, was written and designed before the internet so they can have their claws over it and more power. Uh, but it's just totally unnecessary. And it, yeah, I think it's, I think it's ridiculous. It is part of a larger scheme. I think it's really, really important to understand that you are absolutely correct that this is a sector they don't have that much control over. And that is because at the dawn of the Internet, we had bipartisan consent. The Internet needed to truly be a capitalist landscape. And we had some very good things, very good policies that were put into place to ensure that that happened, including things like Section 230. And that is why the internet was able to grow at the pace that it did. That's why we've seen the kind of innovation we have seen over the past 20 years. But the problem that they have now is that it's gotten so big, it's so successful, and they have lost control of the reins. And the internet is, you know, they want to control all sectors of, of private business, right? It's not an outlier, but the internet is different than other businesses like a Burger King or even an Amazon in the sense that people can use it to facilitate information. They can really use it to change public narratives. And so it is something that they are desperately trying to get a hold of. In this report from CNN, they note that this new proposed rule from the FCC basically designates internet service, both the wired kind that you get in your home or your business, as well as the mobile data on cell phones, as a essential telecommunication akin to traditional telephone services. And that's a statement from the FCC chairwoman, Jessica Rosensorl. So it is it is they are trying to come in and make the Internet a public utility. That is their end all be all goal in all of this. And this is only one way that they are trying to do this right now. So you need to see it in the grand scheme of things, which is that they are desperately trying to make the Internet come under the thumb of the government. And so we need a lot of people to push back on this, not only because, as we've seen in the past couple of years, free market capitalism always works best. And we've seen incredible innovation. We've seen higher speeds. We've seen prices at least stay the same, if not even drop. I haven't looked that deeply into it. We know that these things work best, but we also know that if the government can get its hand on these things, it's going to use it to try to control things. It's going to use it to try to actually make the consumers have less options, worse options, as we see with antitrust and Google. They don't actually care what consumers want, what services are benefiting consumers, what's best for us. It's all about control at the end of the day. And this is why I think it's really vital that people do pay attention to what's happening in the tech sector and particularly around the policies that they're trying to use to regulate it, because it really is about control and controlling you at the end of the day. Enjoying this episode of the Base Politics Podcast and looking for like-minded thinkers? Look no further than She Thinks, a podcast production from the Independent Women's Forum. Every Friday morning, host Beverly Hallberg is joined by policymakers and thought leaders who cut through the clutter and bring you information on the issues that matter most. 
From the economy and education to censorship and comedy, trad wives, and everything in between, She Thinks has got you covered. Hear from guests like Seth Dillon of the Babylon Bee, Amala Ekpanobi, John McEntee, and even yours truly, Hannah Cox from Base Politics. Can't wait for the next episode to drop? You can search for past episodes at iwf.org or search She Thinks on your favorite podcast app. All right. Well, up next, Hannah, Cardi B, the pop star uh, whose famous song WAP uh, is a huge hit among conservatives like Ben Shapiro, is now uh, dip- dipping her toe into politics once again, this time to praise FDR as her favorite I mean, president. Take a listen to this clip. What stays in my mind for a long time is that I went to FDR's house. If anybody loves me, know me, I love FDR. You love FDR? Yes, and I love Eleanor Roosevelt. And you know how he got us through the Great Depression. Real With a war. Mm -hmm. Only president that got elected four times. While he's in a wheelchair. As I grew up reading a lot about Eleanor Roosevelt, she had a very sad life. And like, when I went to her uh her house well she she had different house from her from her husband because you know um fdr mama she was always around like and she didn't really like that like eleanor wanted her space just like me i want my own space all the time i saw the room where churchill and fdr was talking about the nuke that is crazy to me <laughs> like like i'm really here like i like i don't know why i'm obsessed with war so, Miss Cardi B, in her typical eloquence, uh, thinks that FDR was amazing, apparently, and is spreading that message to the millions of young people who hang on her every elucidating word. Uh, Hannah, your thoughts? It's disappointing because I actually am a fan of Cardi B. I think she's quite funny. I actually like her music a good bit. And the interesting thing about Cardi is that she, I think she's um, kind of like many Americans, where she'll be really based on something. And then she loses the plot because she doesn't actually understand what's going on. So it's like, I remember a few years ago, she went on this awesome rant about her taxes and where her tax dollar is even going and the price of things. And it's like she almost starts to get it, but then she doesn't actually flush it out enough to see behind the scenes. FDR was a monster. I mean, probably second only to Woodrow Wilson in this country. But I, I have a personal vendetta against FDR. I, I, you know, I used to do my historical deep dives on the original series of base looking into what broke the system, right? And I would dig into healthcare, or I would dig in to the criminal justice system, or I would dig into unions. I would dig into all these like overarching problems that we still deal with and unpack how we ended up in the mess that we're at right now. And along the way, along the way, the rails always really, the train always went off the rails around FTR's presidency. That's when things really started to like get really, really bad. There'd always been some problems and then boom, you have him come along. I mean, he had so many bad ideas. He did tremendous damage to this country. And it's really such a shame that the victors get to write history because that's what you see her spouting there, right? She toured his house. She got some facts from the tour guides about him and his legacy. She was excited to see the room where he decided to nuke a bunch of innocent people. Like the Japanese government attacked Pearl Harbor, but the people that we killed in Japan with those bombs, many of them were innocent people. And there's great debate over the ethical um, decision to do that, whether or not it was truly needed to win that war. And it's it's just such a glossing over of history and the the true um, issues at stake there. And it's, it's unfortunate because if you go through public school or even most school curriculums, you kind of get this version of FDR too, right? That he came in, he helped um, win World War II, he helped stop Hitler. It's like, well, he also blocked Jews from coming here as refugees. He put Chinese people in internment camps in California. Like, and this is just what I'm talking about on a like just human standard, right? There's many more things he did terribly under the economic policy. But it's it's really upsetting to me that he I think he was an actual like war criminal and monster and awful person and that it, he instead gets remembered in this way. And by the way, he he won four terms because um, we didn't have term limits before FTR. So she acts like this is this big accomplishment. Yeah, we had to enact them because of him. Everyone else had just yeah. followed George Washington's lead and only running for two terms. We had to actually add them because of FDR and his refusal to give up power. Yes, exactly. So 
this was hard to swallow. It was really unfortunate. I wish she's one of those celebrities, though. You wish you could sit down and have an hour long conversation because you could probably turn her, make her a libertarian real quick. Right. But nobody's ever presented her with some of this information. So I hate it. I hate it that she hasn't had more of an education around our history and around economic policy. I hate it that most Americans don't get that. And seriously, people need to familiarize themselves with our history and with who did what and how we got to where we are. Because as I said for some time, if you fail to understand the root causes of problems, you will always prescribe the wrong solutions. And we still have a bunch of Democrats running around wanting to continue implementing the same kinds of policies and ideas that FDR had that have had such a terrible um, pathway throughout the past couple of decades and have had so many bad repercussions and secondary side effects. And if you just took the time to understand that, you would no longer want to implement the kinds of things this guy wanted to do. No, you you wouldn't. And look, it's crazy to me. It's not just Cardi B. It's Joe Biden and so many other people in this country. They openly glorify and aspire to be like FDR. FDR was a tyrant. FDR locked up native-born American citizens in internment camps because they looked Japanese. He tried to pack the Supreme Court and destroy part of our institutions and our political system as we know it because they wouldn't uphold his agenda. And he actually cowed them into reversing uh, some of their rulings with that threat. So he went to circumvent our constitutional order. He clung on to power until his death instead of following, you know, the George Washington lead and only doing two terms. He <laughs> got elected four times, Cardi. Yeah, that's actually bad. Uh, and then this idea that his policies were effective and somehow got us out of the Great Depression is an enduring myth. So I want to read you a really fascinating quote. I was reading up on this. Uh, this is from Fee.org. The Great Depression of the 1930s was by far the greatest economic calamity in U.S. history. In 1931, the year before Franklin Roosevelt was elected president, unemployment in the United States had soared to an unprecedented 16.3%. In human terms, that meant over 8 million Americans who wanted jobs couldn't find them. In 1939, after almost two full terms of Roosevelt and his New Deal, unemployment had not dropped, but had risen to 17.2%. Almost nine and one half million Americans were unemployed. And this is the, the money part. On May 6, 1939, Roosevelt's own Treasury Secretary, Henry Morgenthau, confirmed the total failure of the New Deal to stop the Great Depression. This is a quote. We are spending more than we have ever spent before, and it does not work. I say after eight years of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started, and an enormous debt to boot. Look, it's one of the enduring myths of our time that FDR saved us from the Great Depression. In fact, a lot of people think his New Deal policies lengthened and worsened it, and one of the other culprits was the Smoot-Hawley tariffs that were signed before FDR, but he could have worked to repeal much earlier. They really made the Great Depression worse. All in all, I just can't imagine any other, his, uh, basically, president in history that could have done... Like, imagine if people just praised Andrew Jackson, despite the Trail of Tears. Like, like it wouldn't be viewed as normal to just idolize somebody who committed such rank atrocities against our own citizens or against people who did nothing wrong. And yet when it comes to FDR, because he laid the foundations for the modern welfare state that progressives so much uh, are so in love with, they just give him a pass. They basically just eh, like, like they think we can't have a statue of Thomas Jefferson because he owned slaves, but FDR can be their hero despite locking up Asian looking American citizens. It doesn't make sense. I do believe you can evaluate people who are historical figures and separate the good from the bad and look at pieces. And I would be willing to do that with FDR. I still think it's mostly bad. It's like uh, five there are, good. Yeah, he did a few things uh, that were good. But yeah, mostly bad. I'm willing to have that nuanced conversation. But progressives are like, well, any founding father who owns slaves is all completely terrible. We can never think anything they did was good. But also FDR, yeah, forget that whole Japanese internment thing. He gave us more welfare. Like, you can't have it both ways there, folks. Yeah, but I don't think that's just isolated to FDR. I feel like they do this with almost all Democrats, right? They never want to talk about the downsides to their administrations or to their tenures. 
even up to Obama, right? I mean, there's so few people on the left that will actually reckon with Obama's awful foreign policy and many of his civil rights violations. He was the biggest, most punitive um, person towards whistleblowers. I think I can recall in history, there's so many problems that you see with him. It's a trend that continues where they will castigate any member of the right for any small infraction that they make, and yet they will sweep massive amounts of, of really troubling things under the rug for anybody who just has a D next to their name. And I'm not saying that the right doesn't have somewhat of that tendency, but the media is not in lockstep with the right. And you don't have the public school system in lockstep with the right that is rewriting the history books and forgetting to include all these really important facts. And so you do get this presentation of history that's completely inaccurate, right? It makes me think of Hamilton, the musical, when they say, who writes your story, who tells your story. It, it matters. And that's why I have such an issue with our education system, such an issue with the media, because you really are getting such a one-sided view of history unless you go do your digging. And that's why it's so important to take the time to do that because nobody's going to educate you but yourself. Hey guys, Brad here. I just want to make sure you're staying in the loop on all things face politics. We've also got two new shows you should check out. One is my new show, Damage Control, where I'm teaming up with right of center LGBT guests to restore sanity on these increasingly unhinged issues. Then there's Hannah's show, Copaganda, where she's reacting to videos of police brutality and exposing the systemic flaws in the US criminal justice system. Check these all out on our individual Facebook and YouTube pages. And remember, Base Politics is a nonprofit organization, so you can help us move the culture through content by going to base-politics.com and donating today. All right, up next, socialists are mad at Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom of California because he just vetoed an, a proposal for expanding unemployment benefits to workers who are refusing to do their jobs. Here's a TikTok from one angry activist who is very upset with Gavin Newsom. All right, in today's astounding example of how every single politician seems to be for sale, I give you Gavin Newsom. Yesterday, it was announced that Governor Gavin Newsom vetoed the WGA and sag after backed bill that would give unemployment benefits to striking workers that were ordered to strike by their unions. Now, this is not a bill or a law that is without precedent because it already exists in New York City, and they're looking at passing it in multiple other cities and states all across the United States. Gavin Newsom works more for the billionaires than he works for his constituents. He works more for the billionaires than he works for California. He works more for the billionaires than he does the working class Americans that support the Democratic Party. So they are really mad at Gavin Newsom about this, and it's not just TikTok activists. We've got Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher, who is a former uh, Democratic State Assembly woman, I believe, um, but she is now the head of the California Labor Federation. So she's a top union official in California. She put out a statement condemning Newsom after this veto. Today, the governor vetoed SB 799, a priority bill for the entire labor movement. SB 799 made striking workers eligible for the unemployment insurance benefits they'd already earned. This veto tips the scales further in favor of corporations and CEOs and punishes workers who exercise their fundamental right to strike. At a time when public support of unions and strikes are at an all-time high, this veto is out of step with American values. We will keep fighting until striking workers get the benefits they've earned. And it's funny too, the socialist magazine Jacobin put out a piece slamming him uh, for this move, saying that <laughs> Gavin Newsom is anti-worker purely by choice, saying he's selling out workers by killing unemployment insurance for striking workers. So, Hannah, I found this backlash mind-boggling because what they're advocating for is unemployment benefits, which are supposed to go to people who can't find work, to go to people who have a job, they are not unemployed, but are simply refusing to do it. Have I, have I hit my head? Like, am I hallucinating or something? No, I mean, I was today years old when I realized this was even a thing. I had no clue that when workers went on strike that they were getting unemployment benefits. I'm not well, sure. Well, they, they are in California. California. They do they do in some other places like New York City, but they aren't getting them. But they're, they right. were trying to add this and the legislature passed it. 
Okay. And so then he vetoed it. Got it. I had no idea this was a thing. This is absolute insanity. I also have to call out the fact that this woman in her statement said that unions are at an all-time popular high. Ma'am, based on what? They're at an all-time low membership-wise, and that is because you thugs can no longer force people to join you. And that is thanks to really great pushback policy, like right-to-work laws that are now on 27 or 28 state books. It th- it's thanks to Supreme Court decisions like the Janus decision that said unions cannot forcefully take money out of your paycheck. And it turns out when you don't force people to join a union, the vast majority of people don't want to. Again, I repeat, all-time low participation rates. I think it's under like six or seven percent in the private market right now. Now, public sector unions, whole other ball game. But talk about the private market. There's there's no basis for that whatsoever. The strikes have been incredibly unpopular. They have soaked billions up out of the economy already. The, the Hollywood strike ended a couple of weeks ago, and that I think was estimated to have taken four billion out of the economy. Now you have the auto workers who are striking in Michigan. That is already taking at least a billion dollars out of the economy. This is disgusting. I do not support unions. I don't support strikes. And as a whole, I certainly don't think you should get paid unemployment when you are choosing to not work and choosing to stagnate the economy and choosing to make prices go up all because you don't have negotiation skills or the actual skill set to demand more value in your pay. And so you're holding people hostage. I have no respect for it. I'm glad to see this. I am so curious, though, about Gavin Newsom's action. This is one of many actions he's taken lately that make me think when I hear people on the left say he might be jumping in in 2024, I'm like, maybe because it's it's atypical for him. Right. I mean, and again, it's common sense, but I don't expect common sense on the left when it comes to unions. These are the same people who supported AB5, which essentially is the PRO Act we've been railing against at the federal level for some time in California, where they came in and tried to basically make it illegal to do independent contracting or work as an independent person in their market, right? Because they wanted to force people back into nine to five jobs so that unions could then force them into paying dues because California is not a right to work state. You can still be forced to join a union in California. So I'm really curious about the political wins that are making him take this kind of action. Yeah, well, he put out a statement explaining his veto, and he cited the fact that, quote, the UI, the unemployment insurance in, uh, financing structure has not been updated since 1984, which has made the unemployment insurance trust fund vulnerable to insolvency. Any expansion of eligibility for unemployment benefits could increase California's outstanding federal UI debt projected to be nearly $20 billion by the end of the year and could jeopardize California's blah, 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 more policy stuff. The long and the short of it is basically California can't afford their existing unemployment benefits. And so to expand them even further when you it's about to go bust makes no sense at all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> The other thing is expanding it would hike uh, taxes on employers potentially uh, and hike state in- interest payments on the debt. So uh, for all these reasons, it would have all these consequences. So that's what he's citing for. He says, I support workers. I support strikers. Uh, but for those reasons, I'm not going to sign this bill. It's common sense. I think he was probably uh, lobbied pretty heavily by like domestic uh, or by state uh, associations for business and uh, different industries and such that donated his campaign or whatever. But I don't care so much, whatever. I'm sure his motivations are cynical or political or whatever. And I don't really care. He made the right decision here. And I think, look, I have nothing inherently against private sector unions or against striking. You don't have to work like you do have the right to refuse to do your job. What you do not have to have the right to do is to expect to still get unemployment when you have a job, you're just not willing to work. That's not what the unemployment program is for. It's for people who have lost work, can't find work, and are actively seeking work. And it's supposed to get them by in the meantime. It is a total grotesque perversion and an insult to taxpayers that you would ever even feel like you have the audacity to try to claim unemployment benefits while actively employed, but simply refusing to do your job. That is absurd. Union officials are just nuts. They're the most entitled people I've ever encountered. They feel entitled to just benefits to enable their refusal to do their jobs. 
to they think they should be able to strike at no personal cost. No, I'm sorry. You're free to strike, but you need to live with the consequences. You refuse to do your job. You don't get paid. Like this is just common sense. It is common sense. And I'm his statement actually makes me feel hopeful that maybe I've been saying for a while, I think California is hands down the best state in the country. Come for me all you want. I don't care. It is the most beautiful, breathtaking place in the United States. I'm obsessed with it. I would love to live there one day. But I've been waiting for it to like really have its reckoning day, right? Because at some point, something's going to have to give in that state and they're going to have to start to turn back towards actual capitalism because it's gotten so crazy there. And it makes me hopeful that he's seen so many businesses fleeing the state. That There is such high unemployment right now that they're going broke. They can't even pay for the people who can't get work in their state that maybe he is having to just restore some sanity to his governing there. And maybe that's the tide that we're seeing change. Maybe he's not trying to jump in to run for president. Maybe he's just recognizing that he's going to have to fix some things if he wants to see a state continue to succeed and, and be a dominant power player in the country. So. I guess I'm a little hopeful in that regard because I would love to see us take California back. I can't believe we gave the socialists the best state in the country of all states to let them take over. It was uh, Republicans were just I don't know what they were doing in the 70s and 80s, but I have a bone to pick with them over that. All right. Well, speaking of California, we have to talk about the now late Senator Dianne Feinstein, who passed last week after a tremendous health battle over the past couple of months that has earned national attention. Many people have called what was going on with her elder abuse. Um, she was clearly in no state to continue representing her state in the Senate, and yet she was refusing to step down. She actually had Nancy Pelosi's daughter that stepped in as like power of attorney and was helping her in some of her decisions. It was all very, very corrupt, and I think there's many things that we can and will say about that entire situation. But In the wake of her passing, a video resurfaced last week that I had not formerly seen, and I have to say it is diconic. We have to roll this clip of Dianne Feinstein owning some little kids who showed up to lobby her over the Green New Deal. We're gonna go in and share this letter, and we're gonna do it all together. Share it in front of Feinstein. We're asking her to vote yes on the Green New Deal. We are trying to ask you to vote yes on the Green New Deal. Please. Okay, I'll tell you what. We have our own Green New Deal. Some scientists have said that we have 12 years to turn this around. Well, it's not going to get turned around in 10 years. What we can do Senator, if is this doesn't get turned around in 10 years, you're looking at the faces of the people who are going to be living with these consequences. The government and is supposed to be for the people and by the people and You know what's interesting about this group is I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what I'm doing. You come in here and you say it has to be my way or the highway. I don't respond to that. I've gotten elected. I just ran. I was elected by almost a million vote plurality. And I know what I'm doing. So, you know, maybe people should listen a little bit. I hear what you're saying, but we're the people who voted you. You're supposed to listen to us. That's your job. How old are you? I'm 16. I can't vote. you didn't vote for me. Well, she she voted. It doesn't matter. We're the ones who are going to be impacted. It doesn't matter. We're going to be the ones who are impacted. I understand that. I have seven grandchildren. I understand it very well. Senator, the cost of not taking this action is far higher than the cost of what the Green New Deal will be. And there is enormous popularity for this bill around the whole country. And we're asking you to be brave and do this for us and and for your grandchildren. I'm trying to do the best I can, which was to write a responsible resolution. Any plan that that doesn't take bold, transformative action is not going to be what we need. Well, you know better than I do. So I think one day you should run for the Senate. Great. And then you do it your way. But by that time, in the meantime, by that time, there's going to be a big problem. I just won a big election. So I remember seeing that video at the time, actually, and it is iconic. It's from February 2019, so this is back when Senator Feinstein was totally with it. You mentioned her health issues. She has been uh, not with it for some time. And before her passing, rest in peace, uh, best wishes to her family. You know, she lived a long and and very impressive life, whether you agree with her politics or not. I believe she was the she was a, a trailblazer in terms of women in politics. 
But I disagreed with her on most things. She was, while not like a far, far leftist, she was fair, solidly progressive on a lot of issues. This was still the most iconic moment. Like she is pro climate change agenda, pro green energy, pro all this stuff. But she wasn't on board with the full Green New Deal. And these kids were brought in by the Sunrise Movement, which is this leftist alarmist climate group that's really just like Marxist, hardcore Marxist. And they tried to use kids, little kids, to emotionally guilt trip her. And they give them all these little talking points that have no basis in reality. Say this, say that, say that we only have 10 years or my generation will be doomed. Say that we voted you. And she just calls them out. She's like, I kind of know what I'm doing, Miss, Miss, Miss Susan, Miss 12 year old, Miss 11 year old. And you didn't actually vote for me because you're 16 unless you're confessing to a crime here. I just thought it was iconic. She put them in their place. Uh, and she really showed, I hate the whole using kids, exploiting kids to get your message across in politics. And, but normally politicians bow to it and, and then just don't just, you know, when they're gone, just go back to what they were doing. She had none of it. And it was an iconic moment. And, and I think if that's what we can remember her for, uh, I I'm here for it. Yeah. I have no love lost for Diane Feinstein. I think she was a warmongering pro drug war, nasty politician. I think she represents everything wrong with the two party system, total shill for the party. Just the fact that she chose to continue to stay in office long past when she was actually capable of doing so, I think is so self-serving and grotesque. I think she is yet another example of why we desperately need age limits in politics. But Take all that to the side for a minute because her dunking on these kids gave me life. It was amazing. They say it's easy to stand up to your enemies. It's much harder to stand up to your friends. I absolutely believe that to be true. Pratt and I walk that walk every day. It is not easy or comfortable or fun. It doesn't earn you a lot of praise. So to see her stand up against a group that, you know, like you said, she probably was pretty ideologically aligned with against something that was such a bad idea like the Green New Deal. I mean, it was really one of the most laughable, worst proposals I've ever seen come across the, the congressional legislation. And so I, I I admire that in her, I guess, the fact that she would stand up and even stand up to kids because that is such a manipulative tactic. And man, do they love to do this on the left. They are always trotting kids out for gun control and for climate change and for these really, you know, aggressive, emotional based issues that they want to use them to manipulate people over. I think it's awful. I think anybody who's propping up kids to get their politics done is actually just a loser. I can't stand that side. Of My people. wingers do it too. And I, I'm I always grossed out by it. But not as much. I do see it more on the left. And especially yeah. the state capitals, it's much more a leftist thing that they do than a right wing thing. So I like to see her stand up. She was right in her points. I love that she called that girl out for not actually voting for her. I like that she told the woman who was there she should just run for Senate then. She was having none of it. She did not care. And it was vastly funny to me. I really appreciated this moment. All right. So last up today, we have a recent speech from Donald Trump where he's talking to an audience about his promise to build the wall and specifically his promise to make Mexico pay for the wall. Let's roll this clip. So when you hear these lunatics back there say, Trump didn't get anything from Mexico. Well, you know, there was no legal mechanism because I said they're going to help fund this wall. But there was no legal mechanism. You know, how do you go to a country and say, by the way, I'm building a wall. Hand us a lot of money. So, Brad, this I thought was so interesting because he's basically mocking his audience, telling them that they're stupid, that his promises were never actually within his abilities and that no such thing will be happening. And yet, as he predicted a couple of years ago, it seems this has lost him no fans within his base. They aren't upset by this at all. But when I saw it, I, I was shocked at the audacity. I mean, people like you and I always knew that he had zero capacity to make Mexico pay for the wall. We always knew that it also was a very, very dumb and bad initiative in the first place that wouldn't even truly address the root issues of undocumented immigrants coming here in mass. And so I... You know, it's one of those things where it should be like a victory lap, like we told you so. And yet it's like they, they didn't even hear it. Nobody heard it except for us. So, you know, it feels bizarre to watch this kind of thing go down. Yeah, this was maddening because I remember at the time him saying over and over again, Mexico's going to pay for it. You, trust me. Or what is he? He always says. I will build a great, great wall 
on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. Mark my words. We're going to make them pay for that wall. Mexico's going to pay for the wall. Mexico is going to pay for the wall. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Who is going to pay for the wall? By the way, who's going to pay for the wall? Who? I was going to leave that one out for the energy speech, but you know what? It never fails. We will build the wall. Who's going to pay for the wall? Mexico. Mexico. Who's going to pay for the wall? Mexico. Mexico's going to pay for the wall. They're going to pay. Remember. Remember I said it. Mexico's going to pay for the wall. And it's very easy. The other politicians come down. You can't get Mexico to pay for the wall. I said 100%. Yeah, this was maddening because I remember at the time he would just say over and over again, Mexico's going to pay for it. You'll see Mexico's going to pay for it. And we're going to build a big, beautiful wall with a, a gate in it. And Mexico's going to pay for the whole thing. And I was not like ever somebody who wanted the wall. I'm I was never super against it, other than I think that it's largely a waste of money. But I was offended on behalf of his supporters, who many of whom believed him and had genuine concerns that they that he was so openly lying to them by telling them Mexico was going to pay for it. There was never any way to make Mexico pay for it. And Mexico was saying, no, we're not going to pay for it. And now he's using the excuse, well, there was no legal mechanism to make them pay for it. Yeah, Donald, we know. That's why we said you shouldn't promise people that, because it would be impossible to deliver. And I feel insulted. I, uh, I, I've i never supported Trump, but I feel insulted on the behalf of his supporters because he just admitted that he lied to them, that he or he promised something he, if he had any sense to him, should have known he couldn't deliver. And then he just shrugs it off. He's like, yeah, OK. And so he did build uh, some of the wall. He did not build the full wall that he promised, but he ended up building a little over 400 miles uh, of border fencing, I believe. Uh, out of the uh, 1,954 miles of U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, this is reporting from Politico. Uh, but only a small portion of the 452 miles, about 40 miles, uh, is newly constructed wall where none previously existed. The rest is like enhanced fencing and such. So he built a little bit of the wall, did not build the whole wall. But most importantly, Mexico paid for zero dollars of that wall. In fact, guess who did pay? Taxpayers. Trump declared an emergency declaration to try to reappropriate money from the military, so from Homeland Security funds, from Treasury Department's forfeiture funds, uh, from the DOD's construction accounts. Uh, he tried to use that money to build the wall. So he, like, he literally just did his best to try to get taxpayer dollars to build the wall. He openly in office, his actions belied his promise that Mexico would pay for it. He didn't even really make any attempt. Like, I'm not saying I support them, but there were a few ideas floated around for how he could maybe try, like taxing remittances to Mexico or something. He didn't even try. I wouldn't have supported that, but like, he didn't even make that effort. He just immediately went to using our tax dollars to build it, which if that had been the promise all along, would be, okay, well, we can discuss that. Is this a good use of tax dollars or is it not? And we can have a debate about it. But for him to just promise something, so and that was a big part of his campaign, the wall and that Mexico was going to pay for it. That was like a centerpiece. This was not some small bullet point, you know, in the um, cliff notes of one policy plan. And then to just openly, immediately renege on it and then expect the audience to just go along with you. It's a cult. Politics is a cult. I'm I'm so done with his bullshit at this point. He has told so many lies. He shows such disrespect for his own supporters' intelligence. Um I I'm just done I, and I'm done of people done with people on either side of, of the political spectrum who just have this cult-like worship of somebody and can never see when they've done wrong or never see when they've done good. I mean, I've praised Gavin Newsom twice in the last month for different things, which is not something I thought I would be doing. But hey, you know, broken clocks or right, right twice a day, right? If you are blinded by tribalism and partisanship to the point where you cannot see when you're obviously being lied to by your hero or where you think they do no wrong, 
something in your brain is broken and you need to reevaluate because I've had it. I've had it with this approach to politics. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. And I think this is I I I hate to say it this way, but I think when Trump, you know, assumes that his audience is not all that bright and doesn't really care that he lies to them, he's not wrong. It's it's absurd to me the support he still has on the right after everything that we've been through with him. It's it's crazy to me that there are still people who think that this is a good alternative, who trust him, who think that he could do anything he's saying he could do again. I mean, it's the same thing like with Fauci. He came out a couple weeks ago and said, I had no authority to fire him. What? Yes, you did. You had absolute authority to fire him. What are you talking about? But he'll just continue to pivot and dance. And until Americans get smarter and demand better, I think it's going to keep getting worse because people see what they can get away with. I will say in the past couple of weeks, I've seen some interesting things more from like leftist TikTokers, but starting to call out the way that they idolize people on their side and sort of what they call like the yes queenization of Democratic politicians, which I like. Um, and they were talking about how, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, as one example, has just been completely revered on the left and just idolized. You know, there's whole T-shirts with like a crown on her head and notorious RGB and all these things. And pointing out that if she had actually stepped down when she should have under Obama so that he could appoint another leftist judge, probably Roe v. Wade wouldn't have been overturned. And so, you know, there's an argument to be made that Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually did a lot to undermine the causes that she supported. And they were going after Dianne Feinstein in that same way and saying that her refusal to step down when she should have is actually stagnating the left and refusing to let other people, you know, younger leaders who are more attuned rise up. And I, I like that energy. I think people on both sides need to become more aware of this. Politicians are not heroes. They are just average people. And I can tell you that firsthand. I spent a lot of time around many of them. And I know when I first started working in politics, I had this idea that everybody in office was really, really smart, very ambitious. I really, I mean, I had a, kind of <laughs> them up on a pedestal. And then when I started lobbying and going and meeting with some of these folks, I was like, wait, these these are the representatives? These This is who's in politics? They're just people, guys. They are just people. And most of them are not all that much brighter on an econ or public policy than the average Joe. They just are, they are pretty ambitious. Like they're usually people who really want to be in power. But that doesn't mean that they're smarter or have these, you know, special skill sets or should be treated like these revolutionaries because most of them aren't. And instead, they need to be looked at critically. They need to be held to higher standards than we hold the average person. And we need to start to really examine what they're telling you versus what they do. And I think if you do that, your worldview will change significantly. You will find it impossible to have a tribalistic mentality you will begin to become so disappointed with everybody like I am and then you'll be able to actually you know call a spade a spade work with people where you can and should but still hold them accountable when they're not doing the right things and that's really how you need to be as an engaged citizen that's that's how we actually could move the country ahead the more we stay in this mentality of partisanship and protecting our own while criticizing the other side it's it's a no-win situation for everybody and I really really hope we can get past it in society and that people will start to wake up to this. So one last thing I want to bring in here on this this question of, of Republicans, their blind faith in Trump. Uh, a recent poll asked Republicans which political leaders they thought were a person of faith. And more Republican voters said Trump was a person of faith than Mitt Romney or Mike Pence. They literally think Trump is a more religious leader than Pence or Romney. I'm sorry. If you think that, your brain is broken. You need to touch grass. You're in a cult. The American church is broken and I think I want out. Like it is. <laughs> ugh. I mean, I'm honestly more disappointed in like Christians than I am Republicans at that point, because not only do I think most people who run around professing to be Christians have no actual theology or clue what they're talking about. It's just like so intertwined with the GOP at this point. They can't tell you what's a Republican platform versus like what's actually part of their religion. And they don't have any idea that a lot of what their religion actually preaches is in contrast to what the modern GOP is pushing. I think that is so disgusting. It's such a failure of the church. And it's also, even if you're not a Christian, if you think that, it's still a failing of the church because they are failing to distinguish themselves and actually live out the values they're supposed to espouse so that you could tell the difference in a moral character, in a Christian character, up against somebody like Trump. And I just, yeah, I, I think- I can't see how somebody would bad. ultimately at like Trump politically. I cannot see how somebody could look at the adulterer, thrice married, divorcee, 
who bra- grabs about uh, brags about grabbing women, who's had all this stuff in his history, how anyone could look at him and see a person of faith? Oh, I can tell you. I can tell you right now. Because if you go sit in the American church, particularly Southern Baptist, you know, the, the Protestant denominations in this country, which are the most dominant, you go sit there on a Sunday and you listen to the actual things they call out as sins. They are completely obsessed with gay sex, with sex outside of marriage. They talk about that almost exclusively. Yeah, Trump, Trump has uh, done that a time or two, I have to suggest. And, and so a lot of people in their pews, and that's why they don't call it out. Because if they actually start talking about gluttony and divorce and cheating and lying and all of these things that are also equally sins, that would piss off the people in the pews. They're not there to actually hear that they're a sinner. They're, here to, they're there to hear that other people outside the church are sinners and to feel good about themselves. And that is what I mean when I say the American church is broken, it is absolutely broken. And that is by design because those people don't want to actually have to reckon with themselves and try to address their own sin. They just want to look at the people who aren't even coming there to begin with. And so, yeah, I can see how you would have that mentality, right? Because they aren't being told that they're being told like, oh, if you're not a Christian, so if you're a Mormon, like Mitt Romney, you're not a moral person, you're not going to heaven, right? They're having these kinds of messages pumped into them versus if you behave like Trump and you live like this, you you might be the one going to hell. They don't want to hear that, right? So even Mike Pence, they even think Mike Pence. Less Republicans think Mike Pence is a religious leader than think Trump is a good religious leader. It's batshit crazy. But you should. There is an old article. You and our listeners should both look it up. It's worth reading. It's by Russell Moore, who is a I think excellent leader in the Christian faith, and he wrote this a number of years ago. I think around 2016 about the history of how the GOP and American church joined forces in the 80s and how there is no distinguishment for the average people within them anymore. They're, they don't know the difference. Truly, they don't. If they did, they would never stand by the immigration policies that Trump espouses to begin with, much less many of the other things that he's done in his own history. So read that article. It's a good deep dive. But yes, the American church is broken. I'm, I've been saying this for some time, and I think it's a huge, huge problem. All right. That's a pretty big hot take, but it actually wasn't my hot take for the week. So let's move on to that segment. Brad, what do you have? So my hot take is that people need to abandon the description of bachelors or bachelorettes parties as your, quote, last day of freedom, whatever that means, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's like you're not free from your commitment to the other person. You've already made it. So this apparently weird but somewhat existent idea that like bachelors parties are like a pass day where you can do things like no no and but two do you if you view marriage as a, as essentially like giving up your freedom rather than building a life with someone else you probably shouldn't be getting married like maybe you're not ready for that or maybe it's not right for you so i every time i hear that it makes me kind of like cringe and i'm like ooh yeah i don't would you marry somebody that wanted to go have like a big bachelor party well if it's just a party, sure. But if it's just a party, but I'm saying like one of those kinds of weekends, I would. No, I like not if it's like, uh, you know, hooking up with other people. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I just I think I mean, I lived in Nashville, which is now the official bachelor bachelorette capital of the world. So I'm just I hate those things anyways. I think they're the most annoying, ridiculous displays ever. I would never have one. But if I was going to do something, I think I'd do it like a joint thing with your friends, like a getaway, you know, something classy to just sort of celebrate with people you love. But I'd want to do it together. I don't I wouldn't be like, see you with my girls. Going to go get hammered before we get married. (laughs) Just think it's weird. All right. That's to each their own. But yeah, Nashville turned me off those things forever. It's like people puking in the airport because they're already hammered at 6 a.m. on their bachelorette party. No thanks. Also, I don't want to wear matching t-shirts. No, no way. Anyways, my hot take is that people need to learn to read the room. And I could tell you a multitude of examples on this, but largely I think people have lost the social graces needed to understand what is appropriate behavior, how to approach people in public. Like, If you're wearing AirPods, for example, that's a pretty clear sign you're not trying to chat. I don't, it it should scream, can't chat. And yet the number of people who still try to talk to me in airports, out on the dog trail, no matter where I'm at when I have AirPods in, is mind blowing. And I'm like, one, I can't hear you. Two, I don't really want to hear you. And that should be evident. Me. 
right? And then, I mean, there's other examples too. Like if you're having a private conversation with somebody and you're like at a crowded room, but you're kind of like two of you standing off the side, the number of people will still try to approach and like interrupt, right? It's so rude. If I see somebody talking to somebody else and I want to talk to them, I'm going to sort of like wait by the side to approach them or maybe signal to them. I'm going to wait my turn. I'm not going to come up and interrupt them. And I just think as a whole, people need to really learn to pick up on basic cues like that in public again, because COVID seems to have broken people's brains. Or maybe it's just when I lived in New York City, these things were more understood. I kind of liked the standoffishness of New York City. That's the New England vibe. I liked that. (laughs) That was my speed. So yeah, people learn to read the room. Leave people who are in AirPods alone if you can help it at all. And you probably can. All right, guys, that's a wrap. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Leave us a comment. Let me know your thoughts. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. And until next week, stay based.